ist der Schnellste aus den Blöcken. Jetzt kommt G. Und jetzt ist Usain Bolt nicht zu halten. Nein, er gewinnt. 9 Seconds 58. Usain Bolt in Berlin 2009. Wade von Nikiak, 43 seconds on the 400 meter track, also a world record. And now we have Kelvin Kipton, almost breaking two hours in the marathon of Chicago just last year. In this video, I'm going to explain how the current world records in track and field align super closely with the different energy systems that fuel our muscles. We'll see how these insights apply to CrossFit and other high intensity sports. And I'll share some of the key takeaways to help you improve your performance, especially on the air bike. All right, let's dive into the science. Hi everyone, welcome back to another What Science video. I'm Komar, I'm a senior scientist doing my experimental work at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. I've spent the last decade studying muscle biology and its relation to health and also fitness. I've published dozens of peer-reviewed articles and now I want to explain some of that science back to you guys. Let's first talk about how fast world record holders run in their track events, focusing here on the men's records. Here I compare their running speed, so how fast they go, over various distances, starting from the 100 meter sprint using Bolt back in the day to a marathon, which we all know is 42 kilometers. What's interesting here is that the speed drops, drops off quite quickly until let's say a mile, 1.6 kilometer. And then it starts to even out. It stays, let's say between 21 and 23 kilometers per hour for any race longer than a mile. What's really surprising is that after the five kilometer mark, the distance of the race doesn't really change the speed that much anymore. It stays pretty much the same. So how is this possible? It all comes down to energy systems. Energy to all cells, including the muscle cells, is provided by a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. I always call it the energy currency of the body. It provides quick energy for contractions, but always needs to be recycled or resynthesized again. It cannot simply uh, be fully used or fully depleted. This recycling is key and it happens biologically via energy systems. These systems can recycle this ATP or super fast or more slowly and this de depends on the demand of energy at that moment. You can for example imagine that sprinting requires a lot more energy per second and walking would require exponentially less energy. In this graph, we're looking at how different energy systems in the body are used during exercise. It shows the power or the ATP needed per second and the time for which the muscles are contracting or um, said another way, how long the exercise is actually taking place. Essentially, it's a way to see how our body's energy systems respond and provide energy during different lengths and intensities of physical activity. So for very intense, quick movements like a power snatch, a high jump or, or sprinting, it's mostly creatine phosphate that is broken down to provide free energy for ATP resynthesis. This happens super fast, but can only last a couple of seconds, unfortunately, obviously. It is mostly this energy system that is used by uh, Usain Bolt during his sprints, and that's why it can uh, achieve such high speeds, high muscle contractions. This is also trainable. Usain Bolt could rely on this system much longer than, than for example, you and me. And that is why he can generate, but also sustain such high power output during a 100 meter sprint. Then we have glycolysis or the breakdown of sugar, both anaerobically and aerobically with oxygen, which yields also a lot of ATP per second, but less, much less than the creatine phosphate system. Depending on how well trained a person is, these systems can give energy anywhere from 20 seconds to several minutes. I'm talking about the glycolytic systems here. For instance, a 400 meter runner will use approximately 10% creatine phosphate system, 
60% anaerobic glycolysis and then 30% uh, a mixture of fat and aerobic glycolysis. And um, he will need that energy to complete the full round on the track. The longer the exercise duration, the more aerobic energy will be produced, which means it is more dependent on the available oxygen. All the way at the end of the spectrum lies fat burning, which has a tremendous capacity to provide energy, let's say almost endless, several marathons, but it yields the least amount of ATP per second and is fully dependent on oxygen. All this is nicely summarized in this graph uh, that pops up here in the screen and shows the actual ATP uh, production per second as well as the byproducts from metabolism coming from every energy system that I just talked about. You can see that creatine phosphate can produce the highest power as discussed, followed by glycolysis and then fat burning. Even when this is interesting, an athlete would be fully fat adapted, he or she cannot provide as much energy per second than someone who relies more on sugars or glucose for glycolysis. That is why, for instance, elite cyclists who obviously heavily rely on aerobic systems and also fat burning also train at high intensity. They, they, they do so because they don't want to lose the capacity to produce energy quickly from more powerful sources, such as, as, as I just said, glycolysis for winning the sprint, for example. You can see creatine phosphate as rocket fuel, glucose for gl glycolysis as unleaded 95 for, a, let's say, a fast Mercedes, and then fats as diesel fuel for an oil old Toyota truck. It is important to mention that energy provision is nearly always a blend of many energy systems. For instance, a 10-minute CrossFit workout is not only dependent on aerobic or anaerobic glycolysis. There will always be um, a blend between anaerobic and aerobic systems and even sometimes a little bit of fat oxidation. So, back to our track records. The exponential speed decay we have talked about for the world records, it lines, almost, lines up almost perfectly with the availability and contribution of the main energy systems. When we run out of the initial creatine phosphate, things start to slow down substantially. It's because the glycolytic and the fat system simply uh, provide exponentially less energy per second than the powerhouse, which is obviously creatine phosphate. Now, let's look at this through the lens of a CrossFit workout. For instance, snatching. One of the interesting things I find about CrossFit is that the sport incorporates weightlifting movements into metabolic conditioning. So high reps, super high reps at relatively low weight. Something that actually has never been done before in sports. CrossFit athletes need to be able to, to lift super heavy one, one time, their one rep max, but also need to be able to lift at moderate rates for a very long time or at least dozens of reps in, in one go. Here, if we plot rep maxes for snatch, for example, according to their reps, amount of reps, we come to a similar graph as we just talked about earlier in the video about the energy systems. On the left side, we have a heavy one rep max, for example, a 130 kilogram snatch. Once the reps goes up, the weights decline initially fast to then level out once we hit 30 to even more 40, 50 reps. That is because at that point, creatine phosphate levels are being fully depleted. Think about it. We are working more than 10 to 12 seconds and the energy has to come from less powerful glycolytic sources with obviously lactic acid production uh, as a side. To get good at CrossFit, it pays dividends to maintain a high power generation in the high rep range maybe even giving up a bit of raw strength at the very high percentages of someone's one rep max. This is something that has been brought up by, by The Morning Chalk Up just recently, I think uh, one or two weeks ago, in their synopsis of the Wallapalooza. Athletes who performed very well in the raw strength events, such as the Snatch Complex, maybe you remember, they did not end up placing very high in the overall rankings. It might well be that having um, a too well-developed creatine phosphate system, you're too strong. 
it actually might hamper your ability to maintain power output at slightly lower percentages of your one rep max. This always reminds me a little bit about my own CrossFit experience. I have to say, I'm, I'm doing CrossFit for a decade plus, and from the moment I picked up a barbell, I felt that my one rep maxes, my, 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 my strength exercises, were always um, super easy to do and also was, was very highly um, placed on the leaderboards, especially uh, lower body like squats and deadlift. But then when there was a workout scheduled with, for example, power snatches and burpees, I was always, let's say, mediocre. I was fatiguing super fast and I couldn't really keep up with, with other guys that I easily beat in the strength exercises. So naturally, I, I would be much better off training for maybe powerlifter or, or being a powerlifter than for CrossFit. And this really, that's interesting, did not really change throughout all those years of CrossFit trainings. I did numerous, numerous uh, metcons and I still felt the same distribution. Very good at one rep maxes, but when I started doing metcons, it just went downhill quite quickly. This discussion of maximal strength versus muscle endurance is, is a super is an interesting one, it's a fascinating one, but I will uh, cover this maybe more deeply in another video uh, in the near future. Comment below if you want to see such a video. Lucas Esslinger, a real OG of the CrossFit Games, uh, once told me that the first calorie on the assault bike is the most difficult one. Here it obviously refers to the fact that it is always seems to take a couple of seconds before the calories start ticking away on an echo bike or an assault bike during a sprint. So if you have a workout where you have to do repeated sets of let's say 20 or 30 calls on the air bike, it's actually a good idea to always sprint or at least go quite hard the first couple of seconds. Here you make use of your creatine phosphate system. Right, this very powerful system. You can generate a lot of power without building up any lactate, at least in the first couple seconds. Then after these couple seconds, throttle down to a more comfortable pace, making uh, use of your more glycolytic uh, systems. Just a tip that I always uh, keep in mind when I do these sprints anyway. All right, that was it. Um, what to take home from this video? Humans have four energy systems that provide energy in the form of ATP to the muscle. ATP needs to be constantly recycled and the rate at which this recycling happens depends on the energy demand of that current moment as well as available oxygen which are linearly related. Because these energy systems can recycle this ATP at units per second, the world records on the track, more specifically the speed at which these world records were, were, were run, correlates perfectly with the rate of energy production of these energy systems. Finally, this holds true for CrossFit as well. The body relies on the highly explosive or powerful creatine phosphate system for, let's say, a one rep max or a two rep max snatch deadlift uh, bench press, but Unfortunately, the system can only last a couple of seconds. Therefore, you will have to go down drastically in, in the weight or, or, or the movements uh, once the reps are increased to, for example, 10 or 20 during a metcon and where you have to do repeated sets, obviously you have to throttle down the weight. In CrossFit or in other high intensity sports, the athlete who can maintain the highest relative weight at very high repetitions has definitely the best chance to win any CrossFit workout. It pays definitely to be strong, but maybe not too strong in CrossFit. All right, that was it for today's video. All links to the papers uh, discussed here are linked in the description below, like always. If you like this content, give us a thumbs up. This really helps out the channel. Stay fit, stay healthy, and definitely see you in the next one. Ciao.